Thank you very much for, for coming to this panel on energy sufficiency. I hope you're enjoying your conference. Um, there's lots of interesting topics, and we've got a very interesting panel for you this afternoon. Just by way of introduction, you've probably got used to the fact now that all the sessions take place only in English. Obviously, this makes life easy for me. I always feel it's a little bit unfair. But, uh, you know, if you, if you struggle with the language, feel free to ask questions or also to wave at people and tell them to slow down. That's probably particularly for me, actually. Um, I also should announce that this session is live streamed. And um, if you're watching on uh, your TV or your computer, you can join in the discussion, but we found Slido was a little bit inconvenient, so if you want to raise a question, just use the hashtag postgrowth2018, and anybody here, you're also welcome to use that hashtag if you want to share what's going on more widely. I, um, we've got kind of two sides to this panel in a way. We've got people who are going to bring forward really interesting and important ideas, and then we've got the other side who are going to respond to those and kind of no propose <laughs> more. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, em the empty minds on this side. No, <laughs> both sides are really important. So these people are bringing forward their ideas. These people have to deal with the practicalities of how to put those into practice, as I do myself. And uh, as I said in the panel I did yesterday and in the opening session, we are trying to put these things into practice, so it's really important that we make practical proposals. And if you have any practical suggestions as to how we can introduce these things, they are extremely welcome. Right, having insulted half the panel, I'll now move <laughs> on to make my opening remarks. Um, so I have been a green economist. I'm still a professor of green economics one day a week, so I'm using these opening remarks to share a little bit about what I think about growth and the relationship really between demand and uh, demand for energy and the way a capitalist market works. So a little bit of scene setting, if you like, before we move on to the more, more detailed um, expert presentations. So I think the most important thing to notice from a political point of view is that um, as soon as we've seen growth stalling and there are fewer proceeds to distribute, we immediately see a rise of far-right politics. I worked on a project with the Greenhouse Think Tank a few years ago, and it was called Post-Growth Economics. It's a book as well. And the, the, the political chapter predicted that that would happen. This was before we'd actually seen significant recession. And so I think, as politicians, we really need to, to bear that in mind, because it's all very well to say we, need, we want a smaller economy and we want more activity. Obviously, Brexit will bring a smaller economy. And so every time I tweet, oh, look, thousands of jobs going in the car industry because of Brexit, lots of Greens pile in and say, fantastic, why are you complaining about that? So from a political point of view, we have to be really careful about what we're wishing for here and how we're going to organize this um, very necessary reduction in the size of our economy as measured by GDP. Because if we look back to the last time we had a, a crisis of capitalism on this scale in the 1930s, what the economists drew from that lesson was that without sufficient demand, sufficient economic demand, the social and political consequences resulting from that failure of demand are insupportable, namely the rise of fascism and war. And so we have to take that into account, I think, in our considerations of how we manipulate and deal with demand. Now, my interpretation is that what happened this time around, rather than a sort of fiscal Keynesian stimulus, what we saw was a, a monetary stimulus through the use of QE as a desperate attempt to reinflate that bubble. There was no attempt to say, is what's going on actually useful or should we shift activity? It was just like desperate pumping with the QE you know, to, to, to try and get the balloon inflated again. But um, that hasn't been uh, effective, I would say. That, that finance has stayed in, in particular sectors and not stimulated the economy, and particularly as we were discussing in the finance session yesterday, it hasn't been directed towards the sectors of the economy that we need to develop to, move, to make that uh, transition to sustainability. So I think what I'm interested in in thinking about when I look back to the 1930s and, and compare that experience with what's happening now is how do we maintain effective demand and how do we ensure good livelihoods for people while simultaneously making that shift towards sustainability? And to me, that's a really important political question. And what we're going to think about in the session today is the relationship between the demand for resources and our economy. And I think those are that relationship is moderated on the one hand through technology, and although I think we're going to hear that technology doesn't answer all our problems, it's important to me as a Green that I, I embrace the technology that's helping us make our processes more sustainable. But on the other hand, it's also mediated through psychology. So 
If you look back at what happened following the 1930s, on the production side, you had the invention of this crazy thing of um, short-life products and um, death dating. So um, essentially, you were making products deliberately that had a short life so that you could carry on making more products and using all the energy and resources to do that so that you could keep people in jobs so you wouldn't fall back into the 1930s. Um, that, didn't, that seemed pretty crazy then, actually, but it doesn't seem anything like as crazy as it does now when we know that we cannot continue to use resources at the rate we're using them. Um, and so, and that, so, so that's the production side. On the consumption side, we had the invention of the so-called industry of advertising, which is just effectively to persuade us to buy things we don't need, in my view. So when we're looking to shrink the economy, that's a sector that will grow considerably smaller in a sustainable society. Um, but, you know, the techniques, the very clever manipulative psychological techniques that were used then and are still being used to encourage people to buy products they can't afford and that they don't really value and that they will throw away within a few weeks or months is absolutely crucial to the, to the kind of, for the context of what we're looking at today in terms of energy sufficiency. We have grown used to a status hierarchy based on consumption and one of the things we're going to have to do is wean people away from that and encourage people to find their identity in other ways. So, um, I think there is a space in terms of this panel to have a discussion around what, what we're talking about when we're talking about growth, you know, the quantity, quality discussion around what our economy is for. But it's also very important to consider when we're measuring the economy, are we really measuring things that have any significance? You know, what's the, the contribution of the advertising industry or a lot of what happens in the finance sector to the well-being of humanity? And... Um, when these things are putting pressure on ecosystems, in my view, what we should be demanding is that we get the maximum human well-being without pressuring ecosystems for the, for the minimum energy and resource inputs. So, um, so I think really the launch pad for this session is a shared understanding from our panelists that the amount of various natural resources that are going to be used or used up uh, are scarce and they cause pollution, and so there is an intrinsic limit built in there. And they're all going to take a slightly different perspective on how we address those limits. So, um, enough from me by way of introduction. I'm very pleased now to be able to introduce to you our first presenter, who's Blake Alcott, and he has a, a PhD in ecological economics. What a great thing to have. I love ecological economics. PhD in ecological economics from the University of East Anglia. His main research area is the issue of the rebound effect, and that's what he's going to be talking about today. He's also the author of several peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on this topic, and he was co-author of a book called The Jevons Paradox and the Myth of Resource Efficiency Improvements. So I hope he's going to be telling us all about that today, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. <coughs> How long do I have to tell all about it? Fifteen minutes. I would like to tell all about it, but, okay, 15, hmm, yeah. this will be tough. Um, oh, there it is, yeah, okay. Um, enact CAPS, efficiency will follow. Um, the basic message is there. I'm asking you to imagine that we had capped resource throughput um, and to, to see that immediately and decentrally and without policy, uh, efficiency policies, without research and innovation policies, we would all try to become more efficient, we would all become more frugal, and changes would happen. So the sort of umbrella of what I'm trying to say is if we try to start with efficiency or a lower population or lower affluence, um, do we really get to capping uh, throughput? or resource input and waste output. And that's what I'm going to say uh, doesn't happen. And this is setting the stage for Ricardo's presentation describing a particular CAPS system. Somebody else is doing the, yeah. Uh, um, the first descriptive thing to say about CAPS is that they, direct, they directly achieve the, the environmental goal by definition. Um, so there's no uncertainty, and if the political will, uh, demo demo democratic political will were there, um, uh, a CAPS system will reduce resource use and emissions. 
Right, now we get to the concept of rebound, whereas efficiency policies, I believe, rebound. And there's my website where the articles I've written is on it. Or just Google maybe Blake Alcott, Jevons Paradox, and they will come up. Okay. Um, yeah, that's good. Um, I decided to put this slide in just this morning because we've been talking about growth, what should grow, what shouldn't grow, degrowth, post-growth, qualitative growth, green growth. And from my viewpoint, um, it's not economic well-being that has to degrow. Uh, it's not even GDP. But <laughs> it's the throughput, which is defined there on the screen. Now, many of you will know this from ecological economics, from the writings of Herman Daly and others. Uh, and in my opinion, this is what has to be degrown. Uh, I think. Right. Uh, again, by definition, th those problems are solved. And in that sense, I think GDP as a measure of the amount of goods and services uh, can do what it wants within those limits. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, caps can be applied to anything, energy, water, phosphorus, land area, damaging gases, anything we think is either scarce or is causing too many pollution problems. Yeah, just, just keep these going. So, yeah. Um, so we have all these sort of smaller l ways to leverage towards less environmental impact. But since we have a policy that we know very well, that works by definition, on the table, why are we pursuing these other things at all? Now, if we quit pursuing them and did away with the research money on them, a lot of you would be out of work probably, a lot of people in the, working in the commission would have nothing left to do. So, but the CAP system is really very simple, and it's, the, the job now is to politically sell it, not to describe it. It's been described. There are dif differences in different CAP systems, and there are many, some things to iron out, but it's not all that difficult. Um, oh, right. And this is the argument that, that if, if wealth were distributed more equally, that would automatically lead to some sort of less impact. Right, again, I better get on to rebound. Uh, yeah, this is just a diagram of, uh, one more. Within the environmental impact is a function of population size, affluence, which is the amount of goods and services pro person, and technology the eco-efficiency with which we produce goods and services. So within that uh, well-known equation, if we work on the right side, boing, boing, uh, it doesn't necessarily work back to limiting input, uh, impact. Uh, I'll say a little bit less, uh, more later about some of the interactions or in interdependencies on the right side, but just one would be that if you lower population, some people say, oh, for sustainability we need a lower population. Well, maybe, and there may be other reasons why population, it would be better uh, to have a lower population from the point of view of other animals, for instance. But if population went down and affluence went up, we'd be back, back where we started. Impact would be the same. Um, and if what I'm going to try to argue here is that if efficiency or echo intensity, if efficiency goes up or echo intensity goes down, uh, that will rebound uh, and we'll just use the resources for something else. And again, impact stays the same. So, Oh, I put a question mark behind taxes because I'm not sure that it's often said academically that taxes and caps reach the same goal because the tax would be high enough, so high, the demand would go down to the level at which one wants natural resource use to be, to end up at. But I'm not so sure that uh, works. But there might be people working on carbon taxes out there who could, uh, we could talk about this later. 
the arrow going across that way means that caps, again, efficiency, population would adjust, affluence would adjust, um, you know, t- turning down the thermostat, riding bicycles, all these things would happen once the caps were in place. Right. Now, it's hard to argue that efficiency, that the rebound effect is 100%, because the science is very uh, inconclusive. So that's why I put the word probably in there. I, I studied it for years, and um, that's sort of just my opinion. And I will give you some reasons why that might be a better explanation than of what's actually happening, which is increased resource use. I think this fall, today it was in the paper, we will reach 100 million barrels per day sometime in October or November. So the reality is that energy consumption and many other natural resources, the consumption of them, have been going up and up and up. So my question to efficiency people who think efficiency works, is where are the savings? Uh, you know, where are the real savings? And the answer that I always get is, and even in the academic literature, is we agree there are no savings. We haven't saved anything yet. But consumption would have been greater without the, effic- the engineering efficiency changes, uh, heating buildings more efficiently, cars more efficient, etc. So this is, the argument is, the whole discussion is very theoretical. The argument is a counterfactual. It would have been greater, but how do you show that? And so you get into theory a lot. If this field of rebound is, I don't know what it is, it's, it's not really very scientific. So, yeah. Okay, these are the types of things that are meant by eco-efficiency strategy is light bulbs should be uh, per lumen, use less electricity, but what if we use the same amount of electricity and we light more, we produce more lumens? Okay, fuel per ton kilometer. Yeah, what, what if we use the same amount of fuel and drive further or use it in an airplane rather than in a car? Uh, land area for agriculture, we've improved efficiency of, of production, water and energy. Well, I'm not sure energy efficiency actually has improved. But we've never taken agricultural land out of, out of production after efficiency changes. We just produce more food, except maybe making a few golf courses. But over the whole picture of the whole world, uh, we don't react to efficiency improvements by using less. We use the same and we get more out of it, more affluence, okay, more GDP, yeah. Now, some of you might know Fatih Birol. Birol, he's a, a Turkish, he's now the um, head of the IEA, the International Intergovernmental Energy Agency in Paris, which I think is part of OPEC. Now, in 2000, he wrote a great article on rebound, and he knows all about it. You know, he's, he's really, he knows what rebound is, and he knows that it could be very high. I won't read this out to you, but uh, that was 18 years ago, and this is a man who's in a very powerful position. And his conclusion was that we're going to need either ca- uh, taxes or caps because efficiency is not enough because rebound effects are so high. Okay. And... When I was doing a study for the German parliament about eight years ago, I read, like, everything. <laughs> That's an arrogant thing to say, but I read so much that... And I noticed that the consensus by 2010 was exactly what Birol had said ten years earlier, that whatever, wherever rebound, total rebound ends up, whether it's 100 percent, 120 percent, or you know, more, as Jevons said, that's the Jevons paradox, or if it's a bit less, it's not working. So we're going to need technological efficiency plus population growth and other factors are pushing energy consumption up so much that efficiency is not enough. I think it's part of the problem and not part of the solution, but at least this is a consensus amongst uh, rebound researchers that efficiency is not enough, and that makes me very happy. So. Now here, the basic story of rebound is, is sort of this. 
you have, during a time period, say a year, you use 100 units of fossil fuel. And now technologically, appliances, cars, everything becomes more efficient by 20%, just so it's visible. So in the next time period, you only use 80, and 20% is left unused. Now the rebound question is, what do we do with this? This is, and it can be answered by economics, anthropology, historians, uh, by a lot of different approaches or just by introspection. Uh, it's interesting that anthropologists and historians, when I talk to them about rebound, they all say, of course rebound's 100%. This is what societies do. They, they, they grow. They don't uh, save. You know. So this is the rebound question. And I was at a session before where rebound got talked about, and I'm really happy to hear that because 15 years ago, Nobody would have talked about rebound. It was a very marginal issue. But it, now it's made it onto the table, and this is, this is progress. Right. This is very boring. You've probably heard this story. Direct rebound is when uh, you have a more efficient car or the society at large, the average if fuel efficiency uh, increases. People can now drive farther. Indirect rebound is that with the saved money in their budget, uh, they can buy other energy services or drive cars. Well, that's direct rebound, sorry. They can buy other energy resources with the same budget. Those are indirect rebounds. Now, total or economy-wide rebound is sort of, the methodology is so unclear that it's sort of, disputed what economy-wide or, economy or total rebound is, I define it as direct plus indirect. And this is the only thing that matters uh, for nature. I mean, nature doesn't care what direct rebounds are. It only cares about the, the total picture, in, in fact, at a world scale, not at EU scale and not at Swiss scale or German scale or any other lower scale. But the methodology, it's impossible Five, okay. Uh, I'd better move on in that case. Um, the modeling is very, very difficult. So again, back to the question of what we do with this. Again, this is sort of just my, uh, my claims. Empirically, historically, uh, efficiency has risen and consumption has risen. Uh, so there's no real evidence that, that consumption has has. Of course, consumption could have risen for other reasons. But I think efficiency is one of the big reasons. But anyway, this is the basic empirical view of the world. Um, now we have specific or direct rebounds in industri industrial sectors, which have been shown to be higher than 100%. Uh, okay. Other rebound studies show direct rebounds of less than 100 and fair enough. But then the question is, what are the indirect rebounds? And the study will typically end with a thing like, oh, they're very hard to compute, but they're considerable, and we don't know what they are. But there's no good models on this yet, I think. And backfire is a word for rebound to greater than 100% total rebound. No, even direct rebound. Because it means that the energy efficiency policy has backfired. In other words, by becoming more efficient with housing, as uh, Paul Hodson was talking about this morning. Maybe you double the number of houses, but I'll get to that in a second. Uh, that's the same one, let me think. Right, this is just sort of psychology. We, we do world average. I mean, a lot of people here are willing to, to live, to tighten their belts, but world average, not really. Population keeps going up. We are able, with the same amount of inputs, to produce more goods and services. It's called the production possibilities frontiers. These are just sort of the theoretical concepts that one needs to approach rebound. Right. Now here, yeah, just see, sort of, uh, thank you, keep, keep, keep running it. Engineers can have the amount of energy used uh, to heat a house, right? But if the number of houses doubles then we're back where we started. I mean, this is just a, a descriptive picture of, of what actually happens. So that's, uh, that was, I wanted to ask Paul that this morning, didn't get a chance, is 
within his remit in the efficiency uh, DG or whatever it is, uh, it seems to me like their remit stops there. They're just looking at a specific uh, energy efficiency increase. Uh, this might be my no, it's next to last slide. I better then skip the rest. If anybody's interested in this, uh, keep going to the bottom, please. Yeah, go to the Breakthrough Institute. I think it's a literature overview, which is the most balanced. Of course, it's the one that mostly most agrees with me, but I think it's the most balanced as well. Uh, Steve, so there's the energy policy issue of 2000. Uh, was where Fatih Birol had his article. If you read that, you know everything you have to know about rebound, about the theory. Um, right. Dorothy Maxwell, that was a study done for the EU, where she said in 2011, she told the EU, please introduce a rebound coefficient into all of your impact studies and all of your predictions for energy use. But it hasn't happened. Because... September 1st, there was the new light bulb rules of the EU, and they, gave a, they had put out a press release on the 31st of August saying this would save as much energy as, I think, four years of electricity consumption in Portugal. But they're not including any rebound coefficient. They're just saying the engineering savings will be converted one-to-one -one into impact reduction. Right. Should I move on? Okay. Uh, better keep going because there is uh, – keep going, sorry. These are specific rebounds that turned out to be greater than 100 uh, percent. Use of coal for, for steel production, uh, refrigerators. <laughs> and the, the so-called, you know, the digital revolution has ended up using – the rebound is way over 100 percent. Incredible. I mean, really, this is again, yeah. I, this just shows that if intensity has gone down, but consumption and everything else has gone up, this is the basic world data. Uh, I want to get to a, a chart comparing efficiency and caps. Could you? Sorry? Yeah, that's what I will do. I can't push it myself. <laughs> this is frustrating. Is that it? No, it's stuck. Oh, it's stuck. Ah, uh, well. Um, I think what basically I'm going to try to end up on is saying, on the one hand, we have caps. It's a, something we know a lot about. It's something that works by definition. Um, it can work fast, assuming political acceptability, uh, which is the big step. That's the big job. Um, what else? And we, we compare it with efficiency... Uh, strategies, policies, they're uncertain because the rebound issue is still not solved. Uh, but I would bet anything, I would, literally I'll bet 1,000 euros with anybody here. We can't test it later, but you know, <laughs> this is pretty cheap. But um, that it's going to be around 100% or more. So, you know, why, here, there it is, but um, it's too small. Oh, it's not on the big, yeah, whatever. Um, Okay, now, the thing that I hope we talk about is, yes, but it's politically so far out of uh, the realm of possibility that we have to do things that are politically more acceptable. But, reminder, Kyoto, the Paris Agreement, is a cap system. It's on the table internationally. The Green Party has got something through the European Parliament for a carbon budget, and this is, can be translated into a cap system. OPEC has been doing a private cap system now for decades where they restrict the amount of oil coming out of the ground. And we, consumers, have to adjust to that. So it's not that outlandish an idea, actually. I guess I can end there, yeah. Fantastic. That's, okay. a, that's a positive ending and nice to have some practical suggestions at the end. So thank you very much for that. So now we're going to move on to our second speaker, who is Riccardo Mastini, who's from Friends of the Earth Europe. He's their campaigner for resource justice and sustainability, 
and uh, he's leading their research and advocacy work on the topics of sufficiency and degrowth. So over to you, Ricardo. Thank you, Molly. So I'd like to start out uh, uh, by saying that my presentation will not be theoretical, but very pragmatic, because the window of opportunity for avoiding runaway climate change is closing fast. And I want to seize the opportunity of this conference for presenting to EU decision makers a well thought out policy to reduce carbon emissions that can be implemented quickly if there is enough political will. Uh, I will now present my arguments in favor of a po policy of carbon rationing building on the concepts introduced by Blake Alcott in his presentation, specifically on his analysis concerning a carbon budget as a physical quantity at which a hard cap on emissions should be set. Slide, please. All right. In January 2018, the European Parliament proposed the adoption of a carbon budget for the European Union. The carbon budget proposal will set out exactly what can still be emitted into our atmosphere if we are to comply with the 1.5 and 2 degrees limits set out in the Paris Agreement. Currently, the European Commission is at work calculating what that carbon budget would amount to. Hence, the carbon budget can provide the EU with the exact amount of emissions at which the hard cap should be put. Slide, please. After a hard cap on emissions is set, the question we need to tackle is how the EU's legitimate emissions should be shared among citizens. If costs are, in, are imposed on energy producers and only affect consumers via prices increases, consumers with less disposable income will see a massive reduction in their access to energy. This is the contradiction at the heart of, of mainstream climate policy, meaning the desire to raise carbon prices to address climate change while keeping energy prices low. But since most of our energy still comes from fossil fuels, energy and carbon prices remain stubbornly linked. Uh, one of the issues with the market-based frameworks, such as the European um, Union's emission trading scheme, is that price-based approaches simply hurt the poorest. In fact, the deliberate raising of the price of carbon makes energy unaffordable for many, effectively rationing energy by wealth. A different approach consists in adopting a quantity-based scheme, placing the cap on emissions downstream, meaning at the level of the energy user, and allocating the right to emit carbon equally among citizens. This approach defines the global atmosphere as a commons and considers that each citizen has an equal ownership right in the atmosphere. A policy approach built on this premise is the so-called personal carbon trading. Slide, please. Personal carbon trading is a form of carbon rationing under which carbon rations would be allocated to individuals on an equal per capita basis measured on the carbon budget available. Individuals then surrender these rations when buying fuel and electricity. Individuals wanting or needing to emit at a level above what is permitted by their initial allocation would be able to purchase additional rations from those using less. Slide, please. The total number of carbon rations that are issued to the economy would be determined by the national annual quota of carbon emissions and would decrease year on year in order to reduce to zero carbon emissions over time in line with the country's total carbon budget. Slide, please. I will now, f I will now focus my analysis on a specific uh, scheme of personal carbon trading known as tradable energy quotas that I will refer to with the acronym TAX that was developed by the Fleming Policy Center. The scheme was developed for the UK, but it can be applied to any other country or to the European Union itself. The tax scheme integrates all sectors of the economy, including households. Under tax, every adult would receive an equal free entitlement of carbon rations. All other energy users, such as the government, industry, farmers, etc., would secure their tax units through a weekly auction. The annual am amount of tax units that are issued either as free entitlement to citizens or that are auctioned to all other energy users are made available week by week to ensure that there is a rolling supply all year long. The proportion of units issued as free entitlements to the household sector would reflect the proportion of national emissions currently produced from the consumption of direct fuel for personal transportation and of electricity for heating, cooking and lighting. In the UK, the emissions from household sector is estimated to be around 40%. Hence, 
Hence, 40% of tax units would be handed out for free to households, with the remaining 60% being auctioned to business and government. Slide, please. Whenever fuel or electricity is purchased, a number of units corresponding to the amount of energy being bought would have to be surrounded to the retailer from the tax account of the customer, in addition to the monetary payment for the fuel or electricity itself. This can very easily be done by means of a carbon card connected to a person's carbon budget. A slide, please. The number of tax units surrendered would be determined by the carbon rating carried by all fuels and electricity, which is calculated on the basis of the life cycle emissions associated with their production and use. The system ensures that all electricity measured in kilowatt hour and all fuels measured in liters carry a carbon rating. The design of tax is based on the insight that all emissions from energy use can be measured simply and efficiently by assigning a rating to energy fuels based on the quantity of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases generated not only from their final combustion, but also from the energy used for bringing that fuel to the market. The emissions a citizen is responsible for can be inferred from the kilowatt hour of electricity listed as usual on, on, on their utility bills and from the liters of fuels listed on gas station receipts. Therefore, the tax system makes it unnecessary to measure carbon emissions directly either from exhaust pipes or homes. Obviously, this scheme would provide a competitive advantage to low-carbon energy sources, since almost no tax units would need to be released when electricity produced from renewable energy sources is purchased. It is important to note that the tax scheme does not require a life cycle analysis of every possible product and service on sale. For example, no tax units are surrendered for the purchase of a chair, but the manufacturer of the chair will have needed to purchase units and they will pass the cost on to their customers in the cash price that they charge. So consumers simply find that the cheaper option tends to be the lower carbon option, while the retailers who are able to offer a lower carbon supply chain receive a clear competitive advantage. Slide, please. Those energy users using less than their entitlement of tax units would be able to sell their surplus at the prevailing national price, which is determined by the auction price at the start of the week. Those who need more could buy these surplus units at the national price, with the process of buying and selling comparable with, with topping up a mobile phone, phone or travel smart card. Tax units can be bought and sold only in the official market. There would be no tax eBay or anything like that. And since the units are electronic and contained in a personal card, they cannot be exchanged among individuals directly. Hence, all trade of tax units um, uh, uh, will happen at the same national price. This price is the result of demand and supply equilibrium. Since the supply of units is fixed by the hard cap, the fluctuation in the price are determined only by the national demand for carbon-rated energy. After tax units pass from consumers to energy retailers at the point of energy purchase, they continue to flow up the energy supply chain until reaching the country's primary energy providers and importers. Finally, the energy providers and importers would surrender the tax units back to the issuing body in exchange for the right to produce or import energy into the economy in line with the national carbon budget. This closes the loop. In other words, at every point where energy moves through the economy, the tax units are exchanged and flow in the opposite direction. Slide, please. Uh, the two main advantages that tax offers over schemes that place the cap on emissions upstreams are fairness and generating common purpose among citizens to decarbonize the energy system. Let's first look at fairness. The system is based on the principle of equal per capita allowances for all, with the guaranteed regular entitlement of tax units for every individual designed to ensure that essential subsistence emissions are safeguarded as society adapts to a low-carbon future irrespective of the price trends of the tax units. If a citizen wishes to consume more than their share, they may do so and without compromising the integrity of the emission cap, but only if they are willing to pay those who use less for the privilege of doing so. Tax rationing does not set an upper limit for individual energy uses, but it does protect essential and fair access to energy. Slide, please. Let's now turn to the taxability to generate common purpose. 
Everybody buys and sells tax units at a single national price. Hence, it is in everybody's interest to keep this price low, not only by reducing their own energy use or its carbon intensity, but also by collaborating with others in doing so and putting pressure on those who are perceiving to not pull in their weight. In this way, it aligns individual and collective interests in order to harness the creativity and innovation of society towards the clearly visible aim of lower energy prices. The high visibility of the energy price of tax units is expected to generate stop-and-think moments that disrupt high-carbon habits. It attempts to define new norms of acceptable carbon consumption and create a clear shared goal of keeping the price of tax units as low as possible and being fuel thrifty. Slide, please. Yeah. I argue that a, that a scheme such as tax is the appropriate framework for our present situation, since it can guarantee achievement of a long-term emission trajectory defined by climate science while standing the best chance of maintaining the necessary public and political support to, sub to survive the subsequent economic effects. In fact, it is to be expected that the average energy use per capita will decrease during the first years of the implementation of the scheme, since the annual decrease in tax units will happen at a faster rate than the rollout of, of low-carbon energy sources. Such a rapid decrease in units year on year is essential for keeping within the very tight carbon budget um, that is available to the European Union. Tax is essentially a scheme for managing the energy descent that is necessary for phasing out fossil fuels, while ensuring that every citizen has a guaranteed minimum entitlement of carbon emissions for the essentials of life. Uh, slide, please. This is why carbon rationing is an essential element of an energy sufficiency strategy. The term sufficiency refers to a strategy of ensuring that no one's for short on life essentials, such as access to energy, while not overshooting our pressure on Earth's life supporting system. Hence, the sufficiency should be understood both as a minimum and as a maximum. As a minimum, it represents a social floor, and as a maximum, it represents an ecological ceiling. Slide, please. How am I doing time-wise? Um, you're okay, five minutes. All right, okay. So a final caveat uh, uh, to this scheme is the question whether it is desirable that the carbon units are tradable. I believe there is really no way around making units tradable, mostly because the households vary so widely in their consumption. If carbon allowances were not tradable, the personal quota of units for accommodating the needs of high emitters would have to meet I, uh, would have to be much higher than what is available given the small carbon budget that is left for the European Union. Furthermore, legal selling of carbon units would tend to redistribute money from high to low income households, since low income households tend to use less energy, and those could sell surplus allowances to gain extra income. If a citizen wishes to consume more than their share, they may do so, but only if they are willing, in effect, to pay those who use less. This emphasizes a conserver's gains principle to complement the polluter pr pays principle. A possible tweak to the tax scheme is the use of an alternative currency for such trade. For example, the Hungarian think tank CWEB for Biodiversity developed the energy budget scheme on the blueprint of tax, but allowing the trading of units only in the form of entitlement money. This alternative currency could be used either to pay taxes and social contributions or to pay environmentally friendly products and services, but as such is not convertible to legal tender money. Slide, please. I will, now, I will conclude now by saying that many policymakers see personal carbon trading as ahead of its time and politically non-starter. But what's politically realistic today may have very little to do with what's politically realistic after another few summers of record-breaking heat waves, uncontrollable forest fires and droughts. Hence, what I believe is the basic function of the community of environmental researchers and campaigners gathered here today is to develop alternatives to existing policies and to keep them alive and available until the political impossible becomes the political inevitable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And uh, I hope 
you didn't think I was implying that your idea was impractical because I'm a, a big supporter of tax and uh, was also a friend and colleague of David Fleming and of Richard Douthwaite, who it's nice to bring them into this room by name, even though they're no longer with us, either of them. So, um, but what I am saying is that uh, while I completely agree with you that we urgently need to do something much more serious about climate change and reducing carbon emissions, we need to turn that into a practical proposal for action. And I'd like us to come out of this session with some proposals for what we can do as the European Parliament and what you can do as campaigners to actually take these ideas forward. Um, but before we do that, we're going to hear from our other speakers. Uh, but I'd just like to give a little chance for people to ask any practical and technical specific questions to either of our speakers on this side, if anybody has any of those before we move on. Yes. Oh, yeah, great. Um, thanks. Um, uh, Francisca Klein uh, from the Uni Autonomous University in Barcelona. Uh, Ricardo, I was just wondering, could you elaborate a little bit more on how you would generate um, revenues by trading the TQs or the allowances? I didn't fully get what you said about that. Right, okay. Or auctioning. Um, yeah, so all citizens, uh, all households would receive the same uh, uh, allowance. They are entitled to the same allowance. But, uh, of course, if you don't use all your energy, all your carbon allowance, you can sell part of it. You can trade it in, uh, in, in the market. And uh, this would, in, in effect, redistribute income from uh, um, lower income house, uh, from upper, uh, from high income households to lower income households. Since they usually use less energy, so maybe they have just one car per family instead of three, so you will actually need less energy than a household, for example, that three cars. And as this transaction takes place and, if, and the seller receives money for, for these units, this generates income for, uh, for that user. Did that answer your question? Okay, yeah, so, but... Uh, one, one moot point or one, uh, one um, something, so different uh, personal uh, trading schemes have been developed and some of them envision that uh, this exchange of allowances, this trade of allowance won't happen through legal tender money, so euros or pounds, but rather through allowance money that can only be used, for example, for pay paying taxes or for insulating your house, uh, um, just, just in order for that uh, uh, income not to be, uh, extra income to be transformed into purchasing power for further consumption, but rather for opting for um, green uh, uh, investment or for paying taxation. Um. All right, okay. Okay, and one more explanatory question. Thank you, sorry. Um, Jan Juffermann from the Dutch Footprint Group. Um, we support this model already very much, very much. It's a very good beginning, but we are afraid that there will be a shift. As soon as you start with this, there will be a shift to more land use. More land use uh, because of bioenergy and using more wood, and that will bring us more CO2. So we might start with this and extend it with land use. And then you can call it a footprint quota, footprint allocation budget. And we have to handle it because of the land grabbing, which is already so fast going on. So land is also could be included in the scheme. If you don't mind, I think I might leave that until we get into the full discussion, because I think it's a really interesting point. I think both our next speakers will be talking about leakages of various kinds, of which that's really one. Um, so uh, if that's okay, I'll move on to our, our next speaker now, who's Fulvia Raffaelli, and she is from the DG Grow part of the European Commission. She works with clean products and technologies. She joined the Commission in 2002 as the person responsible for waste management and recycling issues. She's also worked on the REACH Directive, and since 2015 she's been leading the Commission's unit in charge of the competitiveness aspects of the circular economy, energy efficiency, and climate-related policies. So she's obviously in exactly the right place. And uh, she also has responsibility for the Eco Design Directive, the Construction Products Regulation, and the Construction 2020 Strategy. So we're very pleased to hear from you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I think this is a, it's a very interesting discussion that we must have, so I, uh, I, I think it's a very useful initiative. Um, 
we can go to, to the first slide. I think the, the starting point, the point from where I would like to start is that uh, we, uh, we share the analysis. I mean, and we're not under denying, absolutely not. On the contrary, the Commission is, uh, is uh, fully aware of the big challenges we have in front of us in terms of uh, growing population and urbanization, increased consumption per capita, environmental challenges and climate change that are very strictly connected, of course. Climate change uh, is uh, creating and uh, is, is, the, is having as, a, as effect uh, many, um, many uh, let's say, disasters around that in turn multiply the uh, environmental uh, uh, problems around. And the other way around, of course, the environmental, uh, uh, the, the environmental issues, the fact that we do not take enough care of our environment is having, is uh, um, emphasized the, the effect on the emissions and on climate change. So uh, that, that's the, I think the, we, we are on the same line. Uh, that's, uh, uh, in that context, we also include challenges about uh, uh, poverty and, and social uh, inequality. This is also uh, a very important aspect that we need to take into the picture uh, while why, why designing the policies uh, or the future that we have in front of us. So in that context, the decarbonization and the uh, decarbonization is, of course, an imperative and, uh, and is a very important driver. Uh, there are a lot of uh, energies and a lot of uh, research and, and really uh, going on in this area, but it has not to be taken in insulation. It's one of the challenges we have in front of us. So it's certainly one of the areas where at the moment uh, there is more emphasis on, and it's, uh, it, it, this is very good, but it, it has to be taken, as I said, in a, in a more uh, global picture. And then we can go to the second slide. But actually, I, I'm trying to say, to set a bit uh, uh, the, the challenges that we have in, uh, in going in, the interest, in this transition. We, uh, we are, um, within the Commission, of course, um, designing and taking very seriously what can we do to, to move, to, to allow the transition to a, um, a decarbonized uh, um, model uh, that touch upon all the different uh, actors, uh, but we need to do so in a way that they provide sufficient uh, clean and affordable energies for the growing global population. So again, that it takes into consideration also the other challenges that ensure a cost-efficient uh, uh, transition. And uh, um, it also take into account the synergies and the trade-off that we need to, uh, amongst the different policies uh, that in inevitably we, we have. Something that is very important also in our reflection is the fact that it is a, um, um, realities are very different from one place to the next and you know, from one situation to the next one. And we, uh, we need to take that into consideration and it's very difficult to design policies that um, fits all different needs. So the objectives are clear and they are um, we, the set for everybody, but then when designing the specific instruments, we need to be able to take, take, take care of the differences existing in the different uh, situation. Um, please, next slide. This is the international political context of which the Commission has been a, a, a fully, not only fully subscribed, but I would say, um, again, I should say the Commission, the European Union, because we are really at the, at the, at the service of the policy. But European Union is a, uh, not only the uh, fully subscribing, but really one of the main engine of the, 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 the definition of the sustainable goals, development goals. We fully subscribe it to it. Uh, the Paris Agreement, again, uh, we are, we are um, really committed to deliver on all this international uh, agreement. We are amongst the ones that push more, actually, across the, the, across the, 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 across the, the world and the global situation. And we, we see it like a very clear horizontal political uh, uh, commitment to cut across all different uh, policies. So we, uh, we never, I mean, I'm coming from DG Group, but we never um, design uh, or think about, uh, about uh, um, competitiveness policies without having that in mind. I think this is very important. So the, the political context, the political objectives 
are the ones to, which subscribed in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, and any other uh, forum where we uh, initiate international cooperation. We have uh, uh, also very specific initiatives uh, uh, to, to pursue under, uh, under the different angles. The one I mentioned here, Mission of Innovation, Breakout Innovation in Energy Coalition, we're part of the G20 discussion, G, G7. So we really, it, we are uh, an important actor in you know, all this, uh, uh, this discussion and this commitment, and we are committed to, to go ahead, as ahead as we can, in pushing this transition. Now, what we do, uh, next, uh, next slide. I don't, I, frankly, I'm not here to market what we're doing at the European Commission. I think you, uh, you are fully aware of the different instruments we are putting in place. Uh, we go from, uh, um, well, from uh, increasing the energy performance of the products, eco design, or in buildings, EPBT, and then we have uh, um, more ETS for uh, improving in terms of uh, en energy intensive industries. So I'm not going. I have no, no idea, no intention to go through all these different policies. Uh, what, I, what I would like to say here is that um, it's not only about what would have been today the European Union without those policies. I think it, it, it is also about uh, through, those, uh, through those different tools pushing really the different actors in, in, in that direction, forcing them to us, uh, uh, thinking a new way of thinking and imagining the future in this area. We see it. I mean, maybe we cannot just yet uh, contabilize, but if we, if we take, I mean, the energy intensive industry only sector, we see a clear uh, shift in the, in the last 10 years from a very uh, um, let's say, just uh, denying or this very conservative approach to a fully, and uh, not only understanding, but really embarking in a process of decarbonization. Uh, the, uh, the, we are in a process of supporting the transition, and all these different uh, tools that we have at our disposal are pushing the different uh, actors from different angles to go in that direction. Um, we, um, within the, the, in our jargon, we call often the CAPS, uh, we, call, we call it target. That's, that's what we call it. We have a lot of targets. I mean, frankly speaking, we have a lot of targets. And again, talking from DigiGrow, we are often accused to have too many targets and sometimes in contradiction to each other. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and actually, uh, the, uh, the, the amount of work that requires um, getting do, those uh, targets, let's say, achieved, or again, pushing everybody to go towards the targets with the view to achieve it is very, very big. So uh, I think the setting caps is very important, and he, he, he has a very clear political objective because the, the targets are the ones that set the vision, set the view, and encourage also investment going in the right direction. Now, it's not such a simple as you, <laughs> Professor, uh, described to, um, to then enforce, ensure enforcement of the caps, so really basically uh, pushing also the ones that are not necessary for goodwill and going in that direction. And then uh, also um, ensuring that those gaps and targets are, are achieved by, and the more the, ca the, uh, the objectives and the targets are, unspecific, general, and there are more difficulties to, uh, to go to, to pursue the, those policies. So, uh, and this is, is, let's say, our daily experience. Uh, we have problem already with monitoring the implementation of very, very specific targets, then going broader it may increase the challenge. But as I said, definitely the targets uh, and the, the caps do uh, fulfill a very political objective, which is the one of setting the direction, and that's, that's important. Um, what can we do? I had no um, plan to go much in details, but next that is uh, what can we do more? What could we, can we do differently? Um, I think we, uh, we all uh, realize that we need more integration across the different policies. Um, 
I, I, I agree with your, uh, your, your uh, statement on the fact that uh, pursuing energy, energy performance in buildings only make little sense. I think what least, again, uh, energy efficiency in buildings is a driver, but it cannot be, uh, again, taken in insulation. It has to be thought in a, in a broader context where also uh, many other challenges can take into consideration, and, uh, like, uh, for instance, in installation or synergies with renewable energies or with clean mobility, electrification, and the smartness of the building. So I, 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 and also looking broader in terms of systems, not the building in itself, but in, uh, taken in, uh, in a broader uh, system, possibly cities or even uh, uh, region uh, uh, context. So uh, I think that there is definitely something that we can improve. Um, playing, um, enhancing the coherence and the, uh, the synergies between the, the different policies. Uh, one angle on which we've been um, probably not ambitious enough is how far the material efficiency aspect can also contribute to the same challenge. So how can we uh, pursue the energy efficiency to, and the, uh, to broaden in the concept of energy efficiency to uh, uh, um, uh, resource efficiency uh, policy, because we have the concept, of course, the concept is that, but in, 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 in concrete terms, uh, it has not been maybe enough, uh, let's say, pursued in terms of uh, designing the policy. So that's definitely something on which we can work more. We have uh, already a few, uh, let's say, examples of areas where we try to work in a different way. Well, one is, uh, is the industrial policy strategy communication, where specifically for the manufacturing sector, which is Okay. one of the main contributors in terms of emissions, but it's only one. We have indeed uh, uh, put together the, 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 the challenges, designed the policy in a way that would take it at the same time the low carbon, circular economy, energy efficient approach. So small sign, but going in the, in the right direction. The same we do in terms of financial, uh, uh, financial uh, um, uh, instruments, where again we try to, to, to pull out together. Even in terms of... Uh, um, of uh, um, actors. I think that's uh, something on which we need to, to work more, uh, how to involve more the local actors, the regions, the public authorities in designing uh, those policies, uh, making clearer the responsibility at the different levels, not only having only the government as uh, interlocutors. I think this is something very, very important. Yes, I, I'll go straight to the end, actually. Uh, sorry, the previous slide, this one. <laughs> can we do more? I was saying, yes, we can do more. Um, we need, uh, I haven't mentioned innovation here in terms of technological innovation, because I think it's, we all agree that this is one of the ingredients, one of the really the key ingredients we need for, for the future. Again, one of the ingredients, not the, the magic touch that will uh, uh, make us true, so, but it's definitely one of the elements, one of the ingredients on which we need to work on. We need to more cooperation. We need definitely also to change the behavior. And here, in a way, I'm uh, reconnecting with your, uh, um, your, your scheme, Ricardo, that put a lot of emphasis on the role of each one of us. Uh, and I think this is, is, is an area where uh, there is a lot of work to be done. Um, mean, um, here I'm pushing, I'm meaning um, education and uh, really um, co co conscientization of the different, of each one of us in terms of responsibility facing, in facing these challenges. So um, not only in terms of uh, putting the responsibility and uh, making the citizen be guilty for what is not is necessarily his object, but I think including the citizen uh, in this uh, bigger picture. So, uh, enlarging the, the community of stakeholders and actors which are involved in this process. Again, we have a, a few uh, examples of doing policies in a different way. Um, I think you may have seen the, stakeholder plat the circular economy stakeholder platforms, which is a, a nice, I mean, um, in interesting, uh, let's say, instruments, where, um, which is a, a 
bottom-up approach where all the different actors can uh, not only upload but really share their experiences in terms of uh, circular economy but in, even in broader terms in terms of, of sustainability. I think it's a very interesting instrument and it is feeding our reflection. So it is a way of um, changing a bit the relation between the Commission and, uh, and everybody else. It's going towards a more cooperative model. Uh, and I think it, it, there is a lot to be done in this area. And we, we, are, we are ready to, to, to get uh, inputs and to, to work in different ways. Um, there are also um, practical changes to, be, uh, to allow this transition. Um, the, uh, going in towards more decarbonized model would require also a lot of changes in the way we produce. In, not only in Europe, but across, of course, uh, uh, everywhere, uh, in changing the relationship between the, the different uh, economic actors, um, encouraging cooperation instead of competition. Um, it, it, it requires a lot of uh, data exchange, so uh, also a very in-depth reflection about the data sharing, privacy, and the confidentiality of data, how to handle, how to uh, move towards a, um, a model that use in a more efficient uh, way, in a more efficient way, the different resources it would require um, uh, really a, a data um, gathering and data sharing that goes much beyond what we have it today. So, uh, final words. I think, yeah. The last example I wanted to mention to you uh, that goes into the indicators is the monitoring framework, again, for circular economy that we have adopted at the beginning of the year in 2018. Is, uh, again, it is a clear um, attempt to, go, to move away and to broaden the scope of our policies, taking into account all the different impacts that those policies have in terms of, uh, um, in terms of um, CO2 reduction, but also in terms of consumption and uh, consumption per, per, uh, per capita. So, um, again, I'm, I'm, what I, the final message here that I think we share the objective. We have a, a certain history behind us. We started we, we using that history and that practice to go ahead and to push the different actors to go in the same direction. Um, we, uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy task. It, it can certainly be done in a, in a, in a better way. But this, for, for that, uh, um, but, but we also far from uh, achieving the maximizing and achieving or delivering all the objectives we can in, with the current policies. So um, still a margin of improvement from our side, but definitely open to listen to you. I think we share also some of the, uh, of the, uh, um, of the, um, point to a really critical point, in particular in how to involve the, uh, the citizens and each one of us in this process. And uh, we uh, look forward to see how can we really uh, work together on, on those objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fulvia. So I'm going to move straight on now to our last speaker, who's Philippe Tolkens from the European Commission again, but this time from the, the Directorate for Research and Innovation. He has quite an interesting background because he took his doctorate in paleoclimate modeling. Perhaps you can tell us what that means in a minute. <laughs> um, old modeling, old climate modeling, I'm going to guess, with ice cores and things, from the Catholic mm -hmm. University of Louvain, and then he worked as a postdoctoral researcher on the same subject. He's also worked on climate change for the Belgian federal government, and he joined the commission in 2008 and has worked on various aspects of environment policy, and he now heads up the unit, uh, unit in the Energy Directorate. Over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. So paleoclimate modeling is about um, reconstructing the climate of the past with the models, and those are the same models that those are, which are used for the future, and it's a very interesting exercise, I think, because... It uh, teaches you modesty, because if you try to reproduce the natural, natural climate change, not human-induced climate change with models, and you see how good the models are in reprodu reproducing the past, you know the confidence that you can have in the projection for the future. Uh, and actually, I apply this in my uh, current activities on economic modeling uh, and energy modeling. Uh, when I see reports, I always tend to look at what do these models say about the past? And it's always very instructive. 
I'm not here to talk about that. <laughs> but um, so I didn't prepare slides to save electrons. <laughs> uh, my colleague said uh, all the main, main messages, uh, I think, in this regard. But I'll try to directly uh, reply to, to, to the um, presentation that we heard before. Obviously, here I'm speaking more in my personal capacity that as an AC official, I could not consult my hierarchy uh, on what they think about this proposal, but I try to have a, a balance and also to always put things in the perspective of those who prepare the policy-making process, which is exactly what the European Commission officials do. Uh, science is excellent at telling us what society should do to address issues. Um, but policy making is about what society and the politicians can do, and there's a big gap. Obviously, I worked on the issue of climate change when I was doing my PhD. Uh, I was told, why do we use public money to fund such research topic? It's obvious that the human, human beings cannot have an influence on the climate. Okay, that was in uh, 1993. And we have gone a long way from that. So things have progressed, but the, the critical issue is that the more we manage to uh, convince people that climate change is a threat, we see also, because science progresses, that the threat is always worse than without. And the IPCC, I work for the IPCC, I was ass assistant to the chairman of the IPCC in India for three years, and uh, the IPCC projections have been quite conservative. Because scientists need to be sure of what they say. So they cannot be alarmist, and then the facts show that, oh, those were exaggerated. So they, that's why the, the process evolves carefully. And as we know, as evidence comes in, now we see that things are degradating faster than many uh, thought before. Because we don't know everything. And it's very important to remember that. Uh, for a scheme like the carbon budget and all that, there are many uncertainties. The carbon cycle in nature is extremely complex. And measuring the carbon exchange between the different parts of the biosphere, but also within human communities, is not something that is straightforward. So the concept of... Um, that we heard about these caps, uh, I liked it very much, but a long time ago, in 2000, I met Aubrey Meyer. Aubrey Meyer is the one, if you Google him, uh, he's, uh, he uh, launched the Contraction and Conversion Scheme. And that was in 2000. I was working in the climate negotiation for the Belgian presidency at the time. And I had long discussion with him about music, because he's a violinist, and I played a violin as well. And it started with music. He's not an academic at all, and he was a single man, activist, that brought into the negotiation and he continued through perseverance uh, to, to manage to put his scheme on the agenda of the, of the UNFCCC. It was discussed on several occasions. And it was a cap on carbon quotas per capita with trade. And all the schemes, all the results are uh, there on, on the Internet. I think it's important to pay tribute to these uh, pioneers with good ideas. Now these are being elaborated, modified, proposed scheme, but it's important to look why the, the, the ID so far didn't manage to get further through the policy making process. Otherwise we tend to reinvent the wheel a little bit and we, if we see why it, it was stopped at a certain point, we may be able to uh, become more efficient in, 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 in going further. Because in the presentation that we heard, there was one very strong hypothesis, which was the acceptability. Uh, it was summarized under the theme, uh, the, the terms, uh, political will. I think this is too restrictive. The politicians, but <laughs> I'm not best placed for that, you know, they also do what their electorate uh, will uh, ask, uh, ask them to do. So it has to be broadened, and it's about a general public acceptance. But that is really tough. Uh, because you need to convince the people, the individuals, the companies, uh, and other stakeholders. And CAPS, are, it's an interesting concept, but has it been tried in communities? Has it been tried even in, in a virtual exercise with people? You take uh, 
a borough in a city and you have a virtual exercise with applications, with fake, uh, I mean, uh, just paper uh, certificates and trading. I think we need these kind of experiments and this can be done through a research project, for instance, funded at a national, regional or even European level, if there's an application with a, with a proposal to have real demonstration case. Otherwise, it remains theoretical. It's nice, uh, but the idea is out since uh, 18 years. Let, let, let's try and go further and see where the obstacles are. And I would take an example from my own life. I mean, who here in this room, in this room, has really changed in the last 15 years his behavior uh, because of his awareness on climate change and so on. Yes, I have no car. Yes, I have a bicycle. Yes, I did some limited change, but it's still limited. And if you ask in a com community, okay, now you'll have a cap on your energy consumption. Will you accept it? Uh, 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 are you ready to try? And you take different publics. Some will be more receptive, others much less. And I think these are the kind of uh, now insights that we need from the academic community on the social uh, science aspect of these proposals uh, to how can we go further in the accept acceptance of the schemes because these caps look like top-down solutions and not bottom-up and top-down solutions are not that popular these days uh, uh, we refer to the bottom-up activities in the um, uh, in circular economic platform now we always work with a wide consultation of, of, of the public and this is Quite top down. In the papers that uh, I read, it was referred, yes, but quota worked well under war times. I mean, war times is not the best uh, uh, moment to organize a democratic process uh, because there are uh, urgencies, and of course, people may accept quotas in that particular period, but I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a representative one, and it's not, it's not one that we can use in the current times of, of peace. So we need more social science research. Uh, on the uh, applicability of these proposals, which on paper look great. I repeat it, I really like them. Um, and, and, and real testing. On the cap on um, themselves, I, maybe I missed one element, but I'm not sure whether the cap is on energy consumption or only on carbon emitting energy consumption. It can make a difference, uh, because does it mean that if it's clean energy, renewable energy, uh, it would not be in the quota at all, or whether, so, so this needs to be uh, clear. And also the cap allocation, it's the, the, the proposal is to allocate the initial allocation to give the same quota to every human being on earth, and I suppose they take, have a reserve for those that will um, uh, appear on, on this planet, because of course we need to think at our uh, uh, kids. But should, is that the fairest way of allocating? It may be obvious, but some people may say, yes, but I live in a very cold country. My quota should be higher because I need uh, energy to heat my uh, house. Others will say, I live in the desert. I need uh, energy to cool uh, my house. Why would I get the same uh, quota as somebody living in the Canary Islands where it's the best climate and maybe they don't have the same needs? So there is also the social scientists can address this issue and not take just the initial allocation as obvious everybody would agree with it. No, that also can be discussed. Other aspects is, I, I, my experience with the environment policy is that there are very important psychological aspects uh, that we always face. Um, uh, and I'll take an example, not related to environment, but to, to road safety. We have in the research uh, DG where I work, uh, I work on the program Horizon Europe, the new research programs on discussion on whether we should use public money for uh, research on car safety and very sophisticated system or automated cars and, and so on. But technically, if we want to reduce the number of deaths, everybody, nobody wants any death on the road. But if we want to force with a simple chip forcing your vehicle to enforce all the traffic regulation, there will be some opposition. People will not like that. They will consider that it's hurting their liberty. Ah. So, are we consistent psychologically? Are we ready to accept with automated car that we have to follow all the rules, all the traffic regulations? I'm Belgian. I don't think that the Belgian would like that too much. You know, they love circumventing the rules. <laughs> and, 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 and so, 
But this applies also to environment issues. We all want a clean place, but we don't want too many other tourists with us. Uh, and, 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 without, but, and we are not necessarily fully consistent and also coming back to the proposal here. I think we need to look at psychological aspects of the individuals um, because I'm not sure they are ready to accept a cap like that and to be sort of uh, constrained by, 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 by such a cap. We should also look very carefully at the risk of fraud because it, it, at different uh, moment of the intervention, you refer to the fact that it's simply, simply, it's never as simple as we think. And if you look at the emission trading scheme, that on paper also, economists, the design before, it looked very simple. In practice, it looks much more complicated. And there was a huge case of fraud, uh, tax fraud in France. I don't know if you know about that, uh, which was absolutely not foreseen by any of the academic paper I've read on, on, on this topic. So if we want to make this proposal, or if you want to make this proposal really realistic, you have really to give it to people who are experts like uh, the IT pirates uh, um, to, to find the loopholes and how fraud could be inserted in the system and wreck it. Um, and other message also, and that also I, I attended yesterday a session on energy of this conference, and I, I was quite, I, the picture described by some of the uh, presentations was a bit gloomy in my view. Uh, I've been working on climate change since uh, a number of years, and um, uh, indeed the uh, awareness uh, took time to take off. I think it has improved quite a lot, but there are so, some great news. A look at the evolution of the cost of renewable energy in the last decade. The IEA, so the International Energy Agency, never predicted such a decrease. It's impressive. None of the reports anticipate such a fast uptake of renewable energy. Yes, it has cost. The cost in Germany was high, in Wallonia as well, in others. But that's because, actually, the schemes designed by the public authorities didn't account for the very fast development uh, of research and, through deployment, the cost reduction that was even more effective than we thought. So that's very positive news because we can do much more than we thought we would have been able to do. Another case, uh, like often all, oh, we refer to the fact that none of the environmental agreements uh, work and it's never enough and so on. Uh, on climate, it's clear. We are not on course to uh, reach the two degree target. That's clear. We need to do more, but the Commission is fully aware of that and pushes, as Fulvia said, to the, mo the most it, it can. But there are also good examples. Have you heard about the Montreal Protocol? Ozone depletion. You're probably, many of you were too young when uh, Mr. Ronald Reagan say that it was sufficient to wear sunglasses huh, to be protected. Huh? That, that was the quote of the time. But this problem, in terms of emission, has been fully solved. It took several decades, true, and the ozone hole may recover in another 70 years from now because it's a very slow process and there's, lo there's a lot of inertia in the system, but this has been solved because there are alternatives. So to, to these uh, ozone, to ozone depleting substances. On carbon, I, we were always told when I was working 15 years ago on, on the scientific aspect, there is no alternative to carbon. Now we see that there are alternative uh, energy and this is developing. So what we need to do now is to accelerate, accelerate, accelerate the process that is going on. We may wish to have a revolution, but I'm not sure that in the end, by introducing an entirely new system, we will go faster than we currently can go if we just push a bit more on the existing system. And last point, uh, two last points. It's very important to have a global approach. Uh, in reference to the, uh, glo the, the carbon budget, yes, the carbon budget is a sound approach and needs to be pursued and research needs to, really to look at it and how we can uh, use it. But the car... Uh, we, we, in the papers I read, it is assumed that we know what would be the fair share of EU in this global carbon budget. But this is a political question. Uh, EU is only a small part, actually, of global emissions. And if we don't emit in Europe, maybe others will emit elsewhere. So the global approach is absolutely uh, fundamental. And my last point is, uh, yes, uh, a cap, why not? Uh, on carbon, certainly, it's a very important issue, carbon. But others may say, oh, why not a cap on 
pollutants? Why not the cap on land use? Why not the cap on, well, footprint? You referred to that. And I remember when I was at university, there was a discussion in the, in the Faculty of Philosophy to have caps on the number of children that we should have. And there were some PhD uh, students working on that. And in one type of cap, you can include all the externalities. Uh, would that something that you would look at? Uh, so my plea here is to indeed have a broad uh, approach, global, and accounting for a number of externalities and not only one, perhaps. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and it was very useful to hear your, your responses. I think that always helps to, to generate some debate. Um, I think before we move on to the audience, it will be useful to give our, our presenters on this side a chance to respond to some of the comments. Um, and I'm just going to throw in a couple of questions of my own as well, one of which is, uh, you mentioned that the text is designed as a national system thinking about the UK, but do you see it, is it possible to work such a system on a national basis or would you just have leakages and smuggling and things like that? And the other question is, um, why, why not just have a carbon tax? All right, thank you for the interesting questions and I don't think I'll be able actually to address all of them also in the for time constraints, but uh, maybe it would be good to take a step back and start from some, some assumptions, uh, uh, meaning, for example, the fact that we should, uh, we should uh, be debating about what is the best way to, to go about addressing, uh, addressing the issue of carbon emissions and runaway climate change. I think we find ourselves in a situation of great urgency, and uh, to, quote, uh, to quote President Carter, uh, that say that during the energy crisis in the 70s, that was the moral equivalent of war. I think a climate change, a uh, runaway climate change that uh, took all of us by surprise this summer, is the moral equivalent of war of our generation, of this decade and the decades to come. So the idea that uh, a scheme of rationing that proved uh, itself to be very useful for managing scarce resources and ensuring uh, fairness in times, uh, in dire times such as, such as war, I think saying that uh, we, we should wait of implementing something of the sort uh, until uh, the science around it is clear or our understanding. I guess there would be inevitably some fixes as we go about implementing it. But by its own very nature, it's difficult to uh, test uh, this, uh, uh, this scheme of rationing in a pilot project, indeed because of leakages. There, are some, there is a pilot project actually going on in Queensland in Australia there are clear limitations to it because even if you are a household that is part of that scheme, you can just go and get fuel at a station that is outside your area and drive back and that, uh, and that indeed creates a leakage. Um, so to be honest with you, I found some of, your, uh, some, some of the, some of the criticism thought provoking, but the other not really in the sense that uh, um, they start from, uh, from the assumption in the sense that okay, what are we doing now that is better than, than this idea? Because to my knowledge, carbon emissions in 2017 were on the rise. So I don't really see what, uh, what we are doing now to, 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 address, uh, to address this issue. So if we enter maybe in the specific, um, um, for example, when you're asking about the carbon, for example, when you're asking about the carbon intensity, it would be on a life cycle assessment. So the cap would not be on, uh, on energy by rate, it would be on the carbon emitted in the life cycle assessment of bringing that energy to the market. So also renewable energy indeed would require, uh, energy produced from renewable energy sources would require some, uh, some tax because indeed uh, the, the metals for producing wind turbines are of course uh, um, factored in. Uh, in terms of the psychological acceptability of, um, of caps, Yes, I guess that there is uh, not so much appetite uh, uh, for the citizen in the street now to endorse this policy of cap for the simple reason that we are presenting them with the alternative of doing nothing. But at the same time, we, are, we, not, we know that we are condemning ourselves to have to do much more uh, drastic cuts in the decades to come. So, of course, it's a weak problem, the one of climate change, because there is a, a time lag between the moment in which uh, uh, the emissions are... Um, 
are pumped into the atmosphere in the moment in which actually we start uh, feeling the heat of that. But uh, at the same time, I think uh, it, it should be in the spirit of policy making and uh, decision makers and statement, the one of having a longer time perspective and also something that is not uh, so obviously uh, evident to, to all of us. But if science informs us on, this, on these issues we are walking into, I think this makes uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of, of acceptability the real challenge. How can we actually communicate to people that uh, this is the most equitable, fair, and uh, effective way of going about uh, cutting our emissions? Uh, I can go into the uh, issue. Yeah, uh, I feel like I haven't addressed all of them, but I'm yeah. absolutely fine with opening. Fine. This okay, so let's. So let's uh, give Blake a chance to address some of those points and then we'll come to you. Um, <laughs> a slow start, sorry. I think probably the question that we all have is the one about political acceptability or psychological mm -hmm. acceptability. I mean, I love hearing this from you, Philip, that it's good on paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, to my mind, this is progress. You know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, that we're talking about that we're talking about degrowth is progress, that rebound is no longer some word from outer space, and that we, that we could, a lot of us could agree that some CAP system is discussable. I mean, this really makes me happy. This wasn't the case 10 years ago. But I, I think all the, the details about the distri distribution, if it's right, just equal amounts per person, there will have to be corrections for people who because of reasons of their health or where they live. Uh, there would be corrections, but I think they might need more than other people. But I think that has, if that stays within the overall budget at the expense of other people's, then the cap is still uh, has integrity. It's still hard. And, and I, think, I think that's solvable. I like the point. About global, yes, of course, because of leakage. I mean, the EU might even succeed in not using stuff coming out of the ground. But if it happens somewhere else, then the, the effect on climate change, the climate doesn't care where it comes from. So, of course, uh, now about the acceptability, I, maybe this is the important thing. Now, I'm Swiss, and I vote in Switzerland a lot because we have referenda and initiatives all the time. So and that's why when I hear the word bottom-up, or top-down, I have the following contribution to that, and that is that, in a way, if there's direct democracy, as we have in Switzerland, well, it's semi-direct, but it's very good. We, we have to really take a stand as, as citizens on a lot of issues every year. Um, that makes it bottom-up already. You know, I mean, I think we have to stick to democracy. This can't be enforced even subtly by politicians. This has to be accepted by the people. And that's why I say we need to start working now on, on the social marketing of the CAPS. I hope that's enough. But, so I have two concrete questions. One is to, to Fulvia. Um, could you divert some research money uh, to a new rebound study. Now, I know I'm sort of against rebound studies, but I mean a, a, scoping, a scoping study or whatever it's called to pick up on what Dorothy Maxwell did in 2011 and go back over the, the rebound question from in DG growth. And you, you talked about new um, indicators or something and really go into this question of, you know, if efficiency changes then this increases growth. I think we all agree on this right now. In fact, there are people now in the IEA. The IEA's line right now is rebound is wonderful because it increases prosperity. You know, and this is very humorous to me because it used to be denied, and now we're saying, oh, no, it's big, and the bigger it is, the better. And it's very good for GDP. It's very good for affluence, but it's not good for uh, degrowing throughput. One more thing to Philip. Could you, could you finance some of these, this research into CAPS? In other words, doing some uh, further research on experiments 
in neighborhoods. Uh, I mean, I, I agree. This is what we have to do right now. But is there the will to, to spend some money on it and take it away from direct rebound research? You can cut all that. And, okay. Is there anything that you could actually do for us? I'm going to um, let Philippe hang on to that question and probably Fulvia as well and take some questions from out there. So I'm going to have three at a time. Try and keep it gender balanced. Okay, so I'm going to start at the back there. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Antonio Freger from the University of Porto. Um, Can you put your microphone on? Is it not working? Yeah. Red light is on. Yeah? Okay. So the, the, the key point that the, perhaps even I feel confused about, about the point developed by... by that, that is better? Okay, I'll do that like that then. So I feel a bit confused about the point brought by the Friends of the Earth representative here. Because what I see, maybe I'm a bit confused, but what I see is that you are proposing a situation in which the caps, which I think is a really good idea, become entangled in an economic market uh, along the lines of those who can pay can have a, a benefit in terms of the cap they experience. And I, I find that uh, very problematic for all the reasons that have been discussed uh, in, the, in, the, in the conference. So I, I, I'm a bit confused about how come that has entered in, the, in the, the, the political thinking of the Friends of the Earth at the moment. And I also, um, to add to that, I think it's also a bit problematic that well, there is all this focus on carbon going on here because um, what we see is that the planetary boundaries are much more complex and are just not carbon. And so I'm not sure why we are thinking in terms of caps that are so much focused on carbon. So I leave those two Thank points. you very much. I think we've got one more question. Let's take your question and then come back for some more later. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Yana Shalate Udels. Um, so I also have uh, some questions uh, regarding this uh, carbon cap. Like, how would you admi administer this system? Uh, you mentioned that there would be life cycle analysis, so then I suppose the embodied emissions would be taken into account, but how would you administer such a system per person, and how would you enforce it? And uh, as well, the, the other issue that comes to my mind, mind with it, that it doesn't stop, actually the issue, for instance, we have uh, discussed um, in earlier sessions that uh, we are seeing now transformations in the energy sector, for example, solar and biofuels, etc. But uh, these transformations are reproducing the political economy of the current system, which is large-scale industrialized systems that are unaccountable, not transparent, and uh, have major, major impacts on the ecosystems and on people and uh, such. So I don't, don't see that addressed here. Why would not we have a cap on fossil fuel production or, or, or on high income? And, and also, if, how would you distinguish between like survival and luxury emissions and, and such? So these uh, are my questions. And, and I see this, um, many of these uh, uh, presentations that uh, it's still uh, more of a do less harm approach. I mean, the climate has already changed. We have lost biodiversity already. So I would be interested how, how do we address these issues as well in a more proactive way, not just doing less harm, but, but ensuring that we endure in this already changed world. Thank you very much. So I'm going to come to Philippe, who's waiting with some questions already, and then Ricardo, and then the other panelists, if they'd like to answer as well. Thank you. It would be short. What I can do for you. Um, <laughs> Personally, not much, but uh, you may know that in, in uh, Horizon 2020, so the research program of the European Union, there is a, a very high-profile uh, research uh, well, uh, entity that is funding research, uh, European Research Council. And anybody can submit, uh, it's fully uh, bottom-up, can it submit a proposal. I, uh, you need to know that the success rate is very low, 5%. Yeah. So you need a top, top, top student or a very senior scientist who submits a, a good proposal. And there's even a, a window in the European Research Council uh, which is called a proof of concept. Uh, maybe. 
that could be a way, or other possibilities, and there are calls on social science and humanities aspects of several issues, including energy and climate, and these are, appear in the work program uh, of 2018, 19, 20, and this will continue in Horizon Europe. So there are plenty of possibilities, but not on, only at the European level, also at the national level, to uh, go further in the research uh, on these aspects. And I want to stress here that the social science and humanities aspects of the energy transition are now the key ones. Technology has progressed a lot, but uh, on social science uh, aspects, we haven't progressed that much. And one word, excuse me if I may, on climate and emissions. For climate, you can never say that because you have one warm summer, that climate is changing. Uh, this is meteorology. Climate is the average of the meteorology over a period of at least 30 years. So that's the definition. So for the emissions, it is the same. If you look since 1990, Europe reduced by about 22% its emission. Let's not, you know, hit ourselves on the back all the time. It's not enough what the EU has accomplished, but it's quite a lot. And it's much better than many other industrialized uh, regions. And uh, so we are fully aware that we need to do more, but we have done quite uh, a step forward. I just wanted to check quickly. I know that um, the Parliament commissions its own research to inform our policy making. I mean, is that the case with the Commission as well? And might you actually fund some research like that rather than waiting for academics to apply through Horizon 2020? There is a body of the Commission that does its own research. It's called the Joint Research Centre. They call them the scientific body of the European Commission. They have a work program, they have activities, and they have a whole unit uh, on uh, behavioral economics and other on resource uh, economics. Yeah. All right, okay. So thank you for, for the questions that were addressed to me. And uh, so I'll first answer to the gentleman in the back about his is question regarding, uh, regarding the rationing. Uh, I think that something we should take stock of is that we cannot have a phase out of fossil fuels without an energy descent. So I think putting emphasis on, apart from energy efficiency, but even simply the rollout of renewable energy as what will actually bring down emissions, I find that fallacious for the simple reason that we do know that the rate at which emissions need to go down is much higher than any physically possible rollout of renewable energy. So what we find ourselves in is in a situation in which we have to ration a scarce resource. And uh, if there is not a rationing system in place, automatically in a market capitalist economy, what we have is rationing by wealth, rationing by price, meaning that uh, if the energy price goes up, those that can access that uh, a smaller amount of energy would be those that can, are the highest bidders. So um, maybe the issue you are raising is the one of some sort of financialization of this commons that is the atmosphere. But indeed, the assumption from which I started is that this kind of downstream scheme uh, indeed takes, uh, uh, starts from this perspective of the atmosphere as a common and the carbon budget within uh, specifically is, uh, is indeed something that, that needs to be shared. And what is the most uh, equitable and fair way of allocating this, if not uh, through a plan of rationing rather than letting market forces decide this? Then, of course, if we just say that, yes, it would be enough to ro roll out renewable energy fast enough, I honestly think this, uh, the numbers don't add up. So I guess we need a way to think uh, critically also about the energy descent. Um, Moving on to the following question, which was about administration. Um, tax is a pretty hands-free hands -free scheme in the sense that just like the, the government, the state doesn't need to monitor that every time there is a, a transaction in goods and services, money exchange hands, the same would happen for tax. Uh, it would be a, a little intrusive scheme in the sense that there is no requirement for uh, um, an administrative body to, you know, how much each citizen purchases in terms of electricity or fuel for the simple reason that all, um, all intermediaries from the primary suppliers that bring energy into the countries or, or, or extract it will have, in order to market it, uh, uh, they will need to have both some quotas. And uh, 
the number of quotas will always have to even out at the end of the year. So just like uh, the state doesn't monitor monetary transaction, the same would happen for, for these tax units. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, it would make no sense for somebody to sell energy unless they also receive tax units because they will have purchased that energy only uh, by giving their own tax units. Uh, it's a pretty hands-free and not intrusive uh, uh, scheme the way it's, uh, it's uh, thought out because, uh, again, it's decentralized. It doesn't re it, it's a framework, so maybe this also goes back to, to something that was said by, by Philippe about the top-down and bottom-up. This is a framework. It is a framework that set, uh, um, uh, set certain rules, indeed, for harness uh, people's ingenuity and willingness, indeed, to cut down on their emissions. But, of course, uh, we start from the assumption, I will if you will, in the sense that we have this framework by which uh, people will not probably cut down on their emissions unless there is uh, in a, in a sizable uh, measure, unless there is a framework that makes that sensible, just because we know they want to be a, a consumer taking up this luck, a marginal consumer taking up this luck as it's been the case uh, up to today. Thank you. I just wanted to reflect that as a politician, certainly in my country, most people want more action taken more quickly on climate change, um, and they want more leadership and more clarity, uh, even though we've lived with a conservative government and we've had all sorts of nonsense talked about climate change for a long time. So uh, I think people are scared, and I think they do want us to act. But anyway, that's just in passing. Um, so we've got time for more questions. I know when somebody puts forward a proposal, it's always terribly tempting to just like be very critical and throw all your questions that way. But I would encourage you to sort of think about the issues we're dealing with here more broadly, including the rebound effects. And I would also welcome interventions from people who self-identify as women. Hurrah, I've got two. So I'll take you two first. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a... Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I have a question for Blake. Um... You were saying in your presentation, and you had it in your slide, uh, that there is no uncertainty with caps. And I assume that you were referring to the, the limit of emissions, that there is no uncertainty in the amount of emissions that you decide on with the cap, but there is definitely uncertainty regarding the prices. Um, so maybe it would be a better idea to have a carbon tax where you could... Uh, set the tax at a, at a rate that would try to reach an equal limit as the cap. Um, and then also, especially since you talked about the political acceptability and feasibility, um, it would be preferential to have a tax where you can use the revenues um, to make people with lower incomes, for example, what you mentioned, better off. Thank you. Um, I thank you for bringing back the carbon tax, and I'll take your question now. Sylvia Lorex, Sustainable Europe Research Institute. Institute. My point is to Philip. So as a researcher, I'm delighted to hear you're calling for more research. This is very nice. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, as a researcher, I know that there is a lot of knowledge out there already, not at last on the uh, on, um, budgeting, voluntary budgeting. So there, there, things are done on that. But my main point is what, why to research more on this, what people would like to take. So when, for example, they changed our pension and social systems in Germany, there was no willingness to pay, and there was no point if people would like to have it this way. It was sold as a necessity. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and one more at the back there. I would like to follow up on the question on the uh, carbon tax, also for uh, Blake. Um, since you are from Switzerland, in one of the previous uh, sessions we heard that Switzerland started 10 years ago or so with a carbon tax of 12 uh, Swiss francs per ton and that it didn't work, so they moved it up gradually to 96 uh, francs per ton and we heard that now it's working. Uh, so do you disagree with that or...? or so it's a practical example of the, of the general question that was before. Carbon taxes can work as well if their price is high enough and it doesn't go week after week that the price is set, but year after year politicians can evaluate and can then, and it gives stability. But because one of the criticisms I heard about uh, ETS is that industry does not invest or did not invest because they did not know what will be the price next year and in five years and in 10 years. If they know there's a carbon tax of 30 euro per ton or 50 euro, then they can do their calculations and they have certainty and do the investments. 
in a market where the prices are not known, many people will wait and will not take action. Thank you. Um, to my knowledge, the Swiss system is only on uh, local, uh, country uh, emissions from fossil fuel uh, or carbon-bearing fuels uh, to make electricity. No? Is it broader than that? Is it? Well, okay, I, you know more about it than I do. And you can please say if you're not satisfied with what I say also to Francie. Uh, my main problem with taxes is what happens with the government revenue? It gets spent. And so this is a, a rebound that it's hard to measure how much of that expenditure is simply going to be demand for the taxed item. Okay. Um, and I'm pretty sure this hasn't been very well researched uh, as to whether this actually works or whether this is uh, just a way of giving the government or other people free or cheaper fuel or whatever has been taxed. Um, and as opposed to that, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that the, the caps, because they're physically defined, don't have any problems like that. Um, the uncertainty that, I, that, that you were talking about, I think, Francie, is on what the political setting the cap, is that, because I meant certainty that once they're determined, they work. They're, they're, I don't see any strong arguments that, and, I mean, if you could overcome fraud, if you could enforce it, of course, but every law has to be for, enforced. It's not a weakness in the law against murder that it can't be enforced all the time. You know? But um, that was what I meant was certain, is that once the cap is set, it works. And I put this big question mark behind taxes, but I'm not mathematically skilled enough to show how big that effect is of spending the revenue from the tax. Um, does that go some way toward answering? Yes, thank you. A couple of points also from my side. I think uh, I would like to, to react on, on two points. On one side, on the rebound effect, um, yeah, at this point in time, we have not anything specific. We're not doing anything specific in DG Grow on rebound effect. Okay. But what we, uh, what we are doing is uh, increasing our um, attention in terms of uh, side effect, let's put it this way, of one policy on another one. Um, including, um, including looking at, for instance, the impact of uh, uh, energy efficiency transition in eco design and whatever on raw material, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, leak, leak, leakage, but in particular on the consumption of raw material and scarce uh, uh, resources, because I think this is something that is not often taken into consideration. Uh, like uh, also in pushing in terms of uh, renewable energies, we never take what well, at least for long we are not being taken into account that uh, you need a lot of rare earths to have efficient uh, uh, um, wind power stations. So that in going and increasing that one, you may have uh, another effect. It's not really a rebound, but it's a and uh, uh, let's say uh, an uh, undue effect. And on this one, we're progressively including that in our analysis, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a way forward. Now, also a word on globalization, because I think that this is, is something very, very important. Uh, um, Europe, as, uh, as Philip uh, uh, mentioned, uh, has reduced its, uh, uh, its carbon uh, uh, emissions. Um, we are more or less in line with our uh, commitment in terms of uh, Paris Agreement. Now, um, we don't see the same commitment around the world, and this is creating, this is also having a, a negative effect on the design of other policies in the future, because we, we need to take into account this, uh, uh, this leakage effect, not only because of the uh, or the, I mean, as the moving of companies outside, but also because of the uh, uh, effect or indirect effect in terms of security of supply, in terms of, uh, um, yeah, in, in terms of uh, capacity of the EU system to, uh, to, to ensure its uh, 
uh, is independence in many, in many ways. Um, we would, I mean, we all know that 80% uh, of, of the emissions comes from energy, energy intensive industries, steel, chemical, uh, uh, ceramic, etc. Uh, but, um, and so by shutting down even two or three big steel power plants, we would go down really in terms of emissions, much more than probably what we can do in terms of uh, reducing all our daily consumption in terms of carbon. But, uh, now the question is also uh, has to be taken in a, in a, in a bigger picture and say, are we, uh, is this is the way we want to forward also in terms, as I said, of security of supply and ensuring that we are uh, not completely isolated from what's going around. So I think this is a, an, an important angle to be taken in, a, in, con, in, account, in, in account when we uh, design our future policies. Thank you. I think we've got time for just one more round now, so I'm going to have to be really harsh, aren't I? Right, I'll take yours, and then the guy in the blue T-shirt, and then this chap at the front, and then I'm afraid that'll have to be it. So. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Yefim Fogel, University of Leeds. Um, this is a question to Ricardo and Blake, um, based on a, a concern of a friend, Beth Stratford, um, that caps may uh, increase tendencies of profit-seeking in in other fields, if, if resource extraction is, or resource use is, is capped, um, profit seeking might shift more to rent extracting activities in uh, housing, in land, and also to more monopolization and um, privatization, um, maybe also more exploitation down the production chain. Um, so I'm wondering if you have reflections on that and if that implies anything in your uh, in your opinions on like, what other changes would have to come along to a capsis or cap and chair system, um, yeah, if, if we can find a way of, of preventing those issues. Thank you. Hello, I'm Francois Schneider. So um, I want to come back to the rebound and, and say that, um, okay, there is also, there's not only uh, there's separation between frugality and, and, and efficiency, and there's, there's something that we, we can also talk about, and it's the importance of, on the possibility of, of, uh, of debound, not only rebound, but debound, that is uh, choosing for technologies or, or habits that actually uh, work with limits instead of getting rid of limits, which is like often the, the goal. And so, can you give uh, an example? Sorry? Can you give an example? Also, for example, uh, if you compare like the hypercar, it's very efficient, and the bicycle is also very efficient, except that the hypercar enables to make 1,000 kilometers or more on the bicycle by itself as a limit. And there's lots of, okay. lots of uh, innovation that we can do that are social innovations that are how to organize better also. Anyway, so that's one, one really one, one axis which is very important because it combines actually frugality on efficiency. Um, and so it's not about, super, it doesn't go one to the other, you know, it's like you, you will not rebound with bicycle, you know. Like, um, but this needs to be complemented also by a really coherent work of, uh, at policy level, and not just with resources, also with, with, um, with sharing work, with, with, uh, with advertising, uh, with, uh, with all the, the, the question of needs, because it is so easy that uh, we, we need to think of the frame also, because it's, it's so easy that one policy is not perfect and that it actually leaks into another one. Um, because the danger is that it ends up putting lots of pressure on people if we only focus on one, especially the, 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 the if it's a carbon, a, 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 a carbon cap like this uh, on, on people, it will put people, people pressure on rich people will be able to continue to be privileged co compared to the other and create frustration. Um, and so there's lots of issues here that need to be dealt with. Um, we need coherent proposal for the growth, basically. That is what, what is very important. And um, we need really a, a, a degrowth innovation, the thinking of, of, of also in the EU so that we actually can open like a, a different 
policy with, with occurrence in this direction. Um, Uh, thank you. I'm Procheri Martini, FM consultant. I would like to felicitate... Excuse me, you need to speak closer can to I it. So you need to put your mouth closer to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can All you right. hear? I would like to... Closer. No, it's on. You just need to All speak right. close to it. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Ricardo's paper concerning what is done to reduce and compensate the carbon dioxide, despite the fact that in few years carbon dioxide will be completely disappearing because it will be converted, absorbed, and definitely will not affect the environment. But there are two other poison which must be considered, particularly by the European Commission. Is one is uranium and waste, nuclear waste, which today keeps on emitting very little emissions. Um, and then the second one is uh, shale fracking gas. This fracking gas is being developed very largely in the United States. It has been forbidden in few countries in Europe. It's discussing and debating in the United Kingdom, but it is a very little and dangerous um, gas production for the environment. Uh, by the way, Mr. Juncker, uh, congratulate Mr. Trump a few weeks ago about exporting liquefied natural gas produced by uh, shale gas to Europe. Europe will buy and use fracking gas. So I think this is very important that uh, A, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the European legislation create some means to stop definitely shale gas, fracking, and second, also the import of liquefied gas uh, issued from fracking gas. Thank you. Thank you very much. That point is well taken. Okay, so I'm just going to come down the panel from Ricardo, ending up with Fulvia to close the session. Thank you. Final words. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll take this opportunity to address uh, with Francois Schneider what, what, one of the things Francois said, and I think it's, it's a very nice way of wrapping up, at least from my part, uh, this, uh, this debate. The one of not falling prey to a single issue mindset. The idea that we can just set up a policy that will solve the ecological crisis we are sleepwalking into. I totally agree with that. I think we do need a societal transformation. You said the growth, and I think that's the right word. And picking up on something that Molly yesterday said at the opening plenary about the transitional demands. I think that policies such as uh, these uh, tradable energy quotas can have the value of transitional demands. What are transitional demands? Are non-reformist reforms, meaning that uh, have the appearance of reforms so that uh, they, they, they leave uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the overarching uh, framework in which we operate uh, uh, unaffected uh, at first, but the moment in which we actually start implementing them, they will uh, require for the whole system to tip into a different balance state. So I do agree with you that if we put uh, pressure on people and the limitation on using energy, and then they are bombarded day after day with advertisement for consuming more. Something has to give in the end. And if we have the clarity of mind of accepting that what has to give is not our commitment to maintaining a viable environment for our generation, the generations to come, but it's the consumerist society that we built instead in the past 50 years. Well, then, that we probably, then at that point, we'll probably have achieved the societal transformation we are all hoping for. Thank you. Um, is your name Jan? I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, back to the first question. My take on what to cap is whatever is problematic. You know, it could be land or, or water or phosphorus or anything. Whenever society democratically decides that, that, like, watersheds, aquifers have been capped for centuries, you know, you just can't pump more than a certain amount out of a, a certain watershed. Um, um, it's very frustrating not to be able to discuss the Swiss carbon tax <laughs> in a dialogue, and I think... Maybe we could talk afterwards about it, but I mean, it's great news if it works. I just wonder what the methodology is for measuring success. Like, what are the leakages? What are the embedded 
energy uh, import export i mean that would be my first question but why not you know um I, what ricardo said i really like i will if you will or more precisely maybe i will if you also have to and as i don't think we should approach people and say please be an ecological saint you know and wear the hair shirt do without don't do that don't do that freeze like ronald reagan said you know we don't want to freeze in the dark Nobody does, but if we're all in this, if we can convince 51% of the people that we have to do it, and everybody has to do it, so there are no free riders, I think that's the thing we have to keep in mind, is that um, it's, a, it's a political thing. I, I would like to get away from our thinking about consumers and individuals and start thinking about citizens and political action. And there was a question about which I might have understood, <laughs> maybe, uh, about hmm, the economic system in which the caps would be enacted. And I would like to claim that it, it doesn't matter. That those are different questions. If the question, if the goal is to, to solve the, through, the, the uh, huge footprint of our throughput, uh, ecological footprint, then the caps will do that. Now, the other, regardless of the system, it's system neutral. It could be communist, it could be capitalist, it could be a mixture. Now, I'm not sure I understood your question right, but I would just like to sort of build a wall between the caps system and the rest of the economy or the, the way the economy is otherwise done because caps, they're laws. This is not, it has nothing to do with, it can be cap without trade that I'm talking about. It, does, it has nothing to do with prices. It does have to do with justice and initial, uh, what do they call it? equal initial endowment. But what happens after that allocation and the general economic system, it could be a, any number of systems, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe. One word, just only. Um, we know that there's a lot out there on, on the research, but uh, uh, the constraint, for instance, for uh, respecting the budget, closing the budget, especially in, in Germany, this is something they really pay attention to. For climate issue, the perception is entirely different to, to, to my knowledge. And the resistance to change, even if this audience is probably favorable in your constituency, maybe that people are ready to change. But for those who live in Brussels, look at the issue of mobility in Brussels. Do you see any improvement? It's extremely difficult because people, because of legislation on company cars, because people, uh, yes, same principle, yes, yes, but the others have to drop their car before me. So it's not that simple. And we need concrete outcomes from researchers, demonstrations, cases uh, uh, on the ground with people. And that's why I really, uh, I saw some uh, tests uh, on uh, ecological footprint, and, and we learned a lot from these things. And I, I believe we need more of these experiments with people. It helps them to change. Just, uh, just quickly intervene on one policy that was extremely effective, which was the congestion charge in London. People didn't want it. Ken Livingston was an independent because he'd resigned from Labour, so he could ignore everybody, just introduce it, use the money to improve public transport has been tremendously effective and now everybody loves it so I think as a politician sometimes you just have to stick your neck out even if people say they don't like it because they might be wrong about that anyway that's why I'm <laughs> but of course as somebody from the Green Party I am not in the position to, to get a majority of the votes so that I can see Fulvia um, thank you uh, well I'm listening to you with pleasure and uh, let's say uh, Let's see what's, uh, what's up. This is really a matter for citizen electors in the future. I mean, uh, why, uh, I would be happy to see um, this as one of the, of the issues to be discussed also in the terms of the next uh, campaign for the election of the European Parliament. Uh, because, uh, um, I mean, frankly speaking, I think that at the moment we are run, working with the instruments we have. We see they have an impact because I think nobody can deny, I mean, that the, we, with the different piece of uh, policies we have, either in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of climate change, in terms of uh, uh, material efficiency, have an impact. We try with what we have to, to, to go in the direction. 
I, I agree there may be a, a, a breaking point where we need to do something completely different, but this is, a, is indeed a political decision, uh, and that's, I, I really encourage, I mean, from the citizen I am here, uh, to bring these issues at the attention of the bigger, the larger community we are of electors at uh, the next election. Well, I mean, I think this is really a societal challenge that, that has to be uh, endorsed and, uh, let's say, uh, um, absorbed, I would say, from, uh, at the, from each one of us. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate the, the participation from two people from the, the Commission, which is quite rare here in the Parliament, actually, and that's really appreciated. Um, but I would like to, in, in closing, I would like to suggest that, if, if, uh, if you don't mind, that you take away from this session the idea that these rebounds are actually really important. And as you say, we have very strong targets, but if by achieving those targets we're actually undermining the targets because of rebound effects, then that would be very inefficient. So perhaps you could take that away with you, which is something I think we've, we've taken from this session. Um, and yes, well, you've already applauded half the panel, but perhaps I could ask you to, to show your appreciation for the whole panel. Thank you very much.